I wanted to start a new series, um, which is a subject that is really close to me and one that I really love, which is homotopy theory. Um, we'll be developing theory from sort of a categorical perspective, and from what I've heard, this is probably the way to go if you want to um, get to some of the deeper concepts, um, some of the discoveries when it comes to things like model categories have been really profound and have shaped the deep theory a lot. But it can be hard if you've had um, not so much experience with homotopy theory in general, so I definitely wouldn't recommend this to be the first introduction, um, but it can be very good to redevelop the theory from this perspective, which is what I hope to do here. We'll be following um, NLAB's uh, free um, notes on homotopy theory, with the goal of ending up at stable homotopy theory. So that being said, we'll be assuming some familiarity with some categorical concepts, at least that of a category at minimum, um, the objects in a category and morphisms, maybe even functors. Um, also be assuming some basic topology knowledge. You know, I think in this part of this section, we want to know what a topological space is what a base, what a sub-base is, um, but other than that we'll be developing theory from the ground up. This video will be focusing on the first, um, I guess, sub-section um, on the page. You see the universal construction section. Um, yeah, and we'll just be going from there. So let's get right into it. For the most part we'll be working in the category top whose objects are topological spaces and morphisms continuous functions between them. This is a pretty general category and probably the most general one that we will work with topology in. And it can sometimes be useful to work in a more restrictive category, such as that of compactly generated topological spaces. In this circumstance, we can exploit further structure and properties um, such as something we'll mention a little bit later, which is the property of being a Cartesian closed category. We'll start off with what may be a review of some categorical definitions. And when working with such definitions, it's useful to think about what type of information is actually contained in them. So for example, to begin with, a diagram is in a category, and it has two pieces of information, that of a small category i and that of a functor. Um, so you should think of the category i as a sort of indexing set, you know, like so a finite set, maybe the set of integers, and it's indexing morphisms in the category in which the diagram is. So it's indexing morphisms in C. So if it was a finite category of just, you know, the set 1, 2, 3, you might have maps from in the diagram from x1 to x2, x2 to x3 and x1 to x3, and these would all be um, in the diagram. Just as a diagram was in a category C, a cone is over a diagram, and it consists of two pieces of information, an object Q, and morphisms from Q to elements in um, the category indexed by the small category I, which is in the information of a diagram. Um, but basically, it's not any such morphisms, it's morphisms with this property, that this triangle that you see here commutes. So we have to be a little bit careful, because a cone is not say, it's not necessarily all such morphisms, such that um, this sort of triangle commutes. It could be a subset of all such morphisms. So in particular, a cone doesn't necessarily have to be just this particular triangle. It could in fact consist of many triangles. But when we want to talk about something having a property in relation to all cones, um, it can suffice to just consider these triangles because um, that will essentially cover all cones. Once we understand the definition of a cone, talking about a co-cone is relatively simple because it's just dual, so essentially we reverse the arrows. But we like to have all of our arrows pointing in the same direction 
So we also rearrange, you know, where the xi and xj are. We move them to the top and the object q to the bottom, just so we can be consistent with the arrows. A natural question now to ask is if there are any special cones and co-cones. With respect to special cones, there is something called a universal cone, um, which we call a limit. Now these aren't guaranteed to exist, but when they do exist, we can say what properties they should have. For example, every other cone should factor through it. So it's probably worthwhile to bring up this sort of abuse of terminology. A limit refers to both the universal cone and the object um, in the universal cone. Um, so th if it's a little bit ambiguous, I might refer to the object as the limit object or might talk about just the universal cone instead of just referring it to a limit, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. So also, it's not just the fact that every other cone factors through it, as you see in the diagram, but if you notice, there's a dotted map from Q to the limit object, and that's to reference the fact that this is a unique map. So it's universal in the categorical sense, that there is a unique map from Q to the limit object and that every other cone factors through it and has this property. And again, a co-limit is just dual, so it's the universal co-cone. And this time there's a unique map out of the co-limit object into the any other cone's object Q. Um, and as the notation might suggest, this is actually what agrees with the more traditional slash analytical notion of a limit. Um, and this is also referred to as an inverse limit sometimes. Now, co-limits, limits, cones, these might all seem a little bit abstract. And again, this is one of the reasons why when you're developing something like homotopy theory from a categorical perspective, it can be very fruitful, but it's very useful to have it grounded in some previous experience with the theory. And definitely for limits and co-limits, we definitely get a much better intuition once we start talking about examples in the category top which we will do shortly. Before we can do that, we need to talk about what are called initial and final topologies. Because if you think about it, the limit and co-limit in top, those objects are going to be topological spaces. And topological spaces are just sets equipped with some topology. And, you know, a limit and co-limit, these are universal cones and co-cones. And in particular, if you recall, there needs to be a unique map, in the case of a limit, a unique map from Q to the limit object, in the case of a co-limit, a unique map out of the co-limit object into an object Q. And, you know, what are maps in top? They're continuous functions. And continuous functions can be characterized, one way of characterizing them at least, is by having the pre-image of every open set be open and topologies are precisely what define open sets. So it's natural to see why initial, or thinking about what topologies we equip limits and co-limits with um, is essential. So let's start with an initial topology. So these are defined um, with respect to certain other spaces. So you have a set that you want to equip an initial topology with. Well, you need two pieces of information to define that initial topology. You need certain spaces that you are going to map into, and you actually need to specify which maps you're going to use to map into those spaces. And the initial topology is the minimum collection of open subsets such that all of those maps fi are continuous. Now, it'll be really useful to think about a basic example. So consider that white um, area that I drew to be some space x and that red area to be a subset of it. So how do we define an initial topology on the subspace? Well again we want the minimum collection of open subsets such that the inclusion map is continuous. So if you think about it, this is saying that if we have an open set in x, you know the larger space, if it is contained in s or if at least part of it is contained in s, we want that to be open, right? If we want the inclusion map to be continuous, this is the least we have to do. Every other topology we put on the subspace, if we want the inclusion map to be continuous, has to at least satisfy the property 
that an open subset in the large space X, if any part of it is in the subspace, it needs to be open in the subspace. Well, this is precisely what a subspace topology says. It says that a, a, um, a set in the subspace is open if and only if it is the intersection with an open set in the larger space. So, in this case, the initial topology on the subspace is just the subspace topology. Sort of the exact opposite of the initial topology is the final topology, which is the maximum collection of open subsets such that all of the maps Fi are continuous. Let's look at another basic example. So let this white space here be the set S that we are trying to equip a final topology on, and let X just be some larger space that maps surjectively into S. Now we want to fix one particular surjection, but it doesn't really matter which one, as long as we fix it. Now we want to find the maximum collection of open subsets such that the surjection is continuous. And I claim that this is precisely the quotient topology. Now the quotient topology is the topology on S which says that a set in S, a subset in S, is open if and only if its pre-image is open you know, in the larger set X. Now by definition this is continuous, but also if I were to add another open set to the topology that wasn't already there, you know, something that wasn't already in the quotient topology, then by the definition of a quotient topology, its pre-image, you know, wouldn't be an open set. So the map actually wouldn't be continuous. The quotient topology sort of covers, you know, the maximal case. All of this is of course in preparation for Proposition 1.5, which essentially says that in top limits and colimits exist. And the way of seeing this is a little bit um, hand wavy in a sense because we're assuming that you know that limits and set exist. Um, I'll leave a link down below to uh, something where you can read about that. But the real question is what topology do we equip the limits and colimits with? And as it happens, for limits, we equip them with the initial topology. And now this is the initial topology, again, with respect to the maps out of the limit object in set, these PI, um, PJ, and also with respect to the spaces SI, SJ, and, you know, whatever else is in your diagram. And the reason we can't... Um, put any other topology on this limit object and set is because we need that dashed line to always be continuous. So the initial topology always ensures that the PI and PJ are going to be continuous. And by assumption, those curved arrows, um, you know, being a cone and tope are continuous. And since the diagram commutes, you know, that makes the dashed line continuous. But if we had any other topology, on um, the limit object, then consider replacing the object S up top with the limit object equipped with the initial topology. Well, then the curved arrows will be continuous, um, but that dashed one won't be because there are more open sets in this limit object with the bigger topology than the initial topology than there are in the initial topology and the dashed line is just the identity function so for one of those open sets in the limit object without the initial topology its pre-image won't be an open set simply by you know pigeonhole principle the situation is really analogous in the colimit case you know colimits exist in set and in tope they exist, but we need to equip the cold limit object and set with the final topology, again to ensure that that dashed line is always continuous. Our next example is pretty simple, but it's a good one to think about. So you might have missed earlier, but our indexing small category i can actually be the empty diagram. So what does this mean? Well, it just means that there are no arrows um, in the diagram. So as you see here, I haven't drawn an arrow from xi to xj. That doesn't mean that the limit doesn't exist, however. It does exist. 
what do, what, let's recall what the conditions are for a limit. We need the diagram to commute. Now, that's not to say we need the curved arrow to commute, you know, to equal the dashed arrow and then the slanted arrow. What we need is for the slanted arrows to um, compose with the sideways arrow that would be there from xi to xj to equal, you know, the arrow from the um, limit object to xj. So we need that triangle to commute. But in the empty diagram, there are no arrows. So in fact, any object would make the diagram commute, right? Because there are no arrows. However, where we come up with the limit object is when we consider, you know, that dashed line. That map needs to always be unique, no matter what. And the only case that will happen is if we make the limit object. So the limit object is the point, and there's only one topology that we can equip a point with. So this is in fact the initial topology, um, which is just happens to be the only topology. Now let's consider the co-limit over this empty diagram. So in set, you know, this would just be the disjoint union of the two sets. So in tope, it is also the disjoint union of these two spaces. Um, and this kind of makes sense, right? Because the largest, so to speak, image in S of that bottom um, object S could just be all of XI and all of XJ, which again is just the disjoint union. And the disjoint union is um, equipped with what is called the disjoint union topology, um, which is literally defined to be the finest topology on the set, um, such that those inclusions from XI and XJ are continuous which, um, if you think about it, is precisely what the final topology is. Now let's look at another important example of a limit in tope. We call this the equalizer. So if we have a func two functions from x to y, you know, f and g, we want to consider, you know, what um, part of x will be such that f and g have the same um, image. So like in this example, the top dot and the bottom dot as elements of x, those are the two elements on which f and g both agree. So that's going to be what the equalizer is. But this is the equalizer in set, of course, and we need to consider what it would be like in tope. Um, so the appropriate way to think about an equalizer is indeed as a limit. And if we look at it like this, we remember that we just need to equip it with the initial topology. So indeed, the equalizer would just be those two elements of x, the top and bottom dots, equipped with the subspace topology. We can similarly talk about the co-equalizer. So again, given two functions from spaces x and y, this is the space in which both of those functions agree. So in this case, we would identify those middle two points where the functions disagree to a single point so that they do agree. So constructing a new space in which f and g agree. And again, the appropriate way to think about this is as a co-limit. So it's easy enough to see in set with the diagram, but the actual topology that we put on this new space is the quotient topology. A common type of co-equalizer that you might not realize is a co-equalizer is the attaching space. So if we have a common domain for functions f and g into spaces x and y, um, their images represented by these red circles, the co-equalizer or the attaching space is, you know, the space where these functions agree, which amounts to identifying their images together. The particular way depends on the functions f and g, but um, yeah, it matters that we identify them together. And this square diagram is called a pushout, um, and again, it's a type of co-equalizer. Now, some people refer to a pushout as the specific case of the attaching space, you know, when we consider just y to be a point. So this amounts to identifying the image of a under whatever function um, to a single point. And sometimes this is also called the cofiber. A really important and fundamental example of this in algebraic topology involves disks and spheres.
So the n-dimensional disk is, um, you know, this definition here, which you would usually, so in the two-dimensional case, it would just be a circle, right? Um, a sphere is just the boundary of the n-dimensional disk, but the boundary of an n-dimensional disk is called the n minus one dimensional sphere. So the boundary of the two-dimensional disk that I've drawn is actually a one-dimensional sphere. And let's talk about the pushout of a, um, a function, the inclusion from the n minus one dimensional sphere into two spaces, x and y, which are both n dimensional disks. And the maps um, into those spaces are just the canonical inclusions of a boundary onto the space, onto the disk. And the pushout will be identifying these boundaries. There's two copies of the disks, so what we end up with is identifying their boundaries um, and what we actually get is an n-dimensional sphere or the boundary of an n plus one dimensional disk. The remainder of our discussion will focus around two questions or goals. How do we think about sequences that are indexed by sets larger than the natural numbers which are the typical infinite sequences that we know and also how do we think of morphisms that are quote unquote infinite compositions of um, morphisms. So um, in a category, you're only guaranteed that the compositions of finite amounts of morphisms is a morphism. You're not guaranteed that there will be a morphism that is the infinite composition of morphisms. But as we'll see, we can think about how um, there are morphisms that behave in that way. So let's just talk about some definitions you might or may or may not be familiar with. So a partial order um, is formalizing what this less than or equal sign is. So it has these basic properties which I'm sure you're familiar with. But there's a, a way that we should think about it um, that will be useful in the future. Um, so like let's think about 3 and 5, right? Obviously 3 is less than or equal to 5. Here we're considering the partial order of the less than or equal sign on let's say the natural numbers. But what if we considered 3 um, as a set of 3 elements? So the number 3 represents a set of 3 elements and the number 5 represents a set of 5 elements. Then as you can see there's a unique map from um, the inclusion map. There's a unique inclusion from 3 to 5. So this is actually the perspective we want to take on partial orders. The perspective that um, there exists a unique morphism from A to B precisely if A is, you know, less than or equal to, in quotes, um, than B. So in this case, the partial order isn't the less than or equal to, it's this inclusion of subsets. Now, of course, you might be wondering why it's called a partial order, and that's simply because um, not all the elements in the set that there exists a partial order in need to be comparable. So, for example, if we have a complex number, um, it's not comparable to an integer. You can't say, like, 1 is less than or equal to 2 plus 3i. It just doesn't make sense. So, if every element in the set is comparable then we call it a total order. Now to further um, specify types of orders a total order is a well order so well order has to be a total order but it additionally has the quality that every non-empty subset has the least element. So you might think oh that shouldn't that always be the case but just think about let's say the integers now consider the subset that is the entire set of the integers. And there is no least element, so the integers are not, um, there's no well order on the integers. Or at least the less than or equal to is not the well or is not a well order on the integers. Um, on the natural numbers, however, um, this is the case. So the equivalence class of a well order is called an ordinal. And now you see where we go about talking about like three and five representing something because they're equivalence classes and they're in fact ordinals.
um, is the name for these type of equivalence classes. So to understand these better, we can just think about the natural numbers. So a successor of an ordinal is another equivalence class of a well order, um, but it's one with a top element freely adjoint. So what do I mean by that? Well, consider um, the ordinal three. Well, two is a well order, and a top element is just one that is greater than or equal to every other element. And I can just freely adjoin the number three, and then I get um, the equivalence class of the ordinal three. And so you can see that it is the successor. So in fact, a um, limit ordinal is one that is not a successor. So if you think about like what's the first non-trivial or non-zero um, uh, limit ordinal, you could say it's the natural numbers, right? Because there's no set that you could add, uh, there's no uh, well order that you could add, freely adjoin just one element with and get the natural numbers. So now we're ready to actually talk about um, one of our goals, which was to think about sequences indexed by sets larger than the natural numbers. So we just let alpha be an ordinal. So that's the requirement here. All that our indexing set needs to be is an ordinal. Um, so let C be a category, let I be a class of its morphisms, and then an alpha index transfinite sequence of elements in I is a diagram. And that diagram has two key properties. The first being that it takes successor morphisms to what are essentially successor morphisms um, in the morphisms of whatever category you're in. So exam for example, um, you have a morphism from one to two, it'll take X, there um, is an element that it sends to in the category and the morphisms in the category that sends X1 to X2, right? So that's all that's saying. And the second one is um, very important, and it's it's kind of a, a big assumption, or a big restriction, I should say, on what we're saying. So it's continuous in the sense that for all non-zero limit ordinals, beta less than alpha, we have that um, X star restricted to gamma, such that gamma is less than or equal to beta, is the co-limiting cocomb for x star restricted to gamma for gamma less than beta. So let, let's think about what that means because that's really the hard part of this definition. So um, in the finite case, so um, when beta is not a limit ordinal, this is pretty clear, right? Because um, consider like beta equal to seven. What this is saying is that this cone right here is the universal co-cone um, for the diagram that just goes up to x6, x0 to x6. And this is pretty clear, right? Because if there was any other co-cone for these diagram from x0 to x6, um, by assumption, like we defined that there is a unique morphism if and only if uh, alpha a is less than or equal to b, so it would have to be from x6 to x7 or something greater than x7. But if it was greater than x7, like if it was x8, well then it would factor through this cocone. So it's clear in the, in the um, finite case that this should be true. And our assumption is that this is true in the non-finite case, so non-zero limit ordinals. This is what we mean by continuous, right? So if beta is just a non-zero limit ordinal, then we want this property to still exist. Now, one of the results of this assumption is the existence of what we call transfinite compositions. So, you know, just take beta to be the entire um, alpha. Then by assumption, we have this um, co-cone here, 
And this red arrow, if you think about it, is acting as though it were an infinite composition of morphisms. Because recall back to the finite case, how do we define a map from like x6 to x7? There was a map x5 to x7 was just the composition of the map from x5 to x6 and x6, x6 to x7. And similarly, all the way down to x0, just the composition of maps to x1, to x2, x3, x4, all the way to x7. So in the final case, it was clear that such a map existed. And now we're saying that this red arrow exists by assumption, by requirement, um, for it to be an alpha index transfinite sequence of elements. And in fact, it does act like it was an infinite um, composition of elements, like how I just described would be the case in the finite case, but um, it of course isn't actually that, because um, infinite compositions of morphisms don't exist. Finally, we're going to shift gears one last time to talk about something that I personally find really cool. So, you know, we have two elements in a category, so in our case in top, and we want to consider um, maps between them. So in top, these are continuous maps from X to Y. So these just by themselves are um, the set of all of these continuous maps are just elements of the large category set. But as it turns out, there are certain cases, this is really cool. There are certain cases where we can put a topology on this set. And so we can actually get um, an element of tope. We can get a, an, a topological space that represents continuous maps from X to Y. As one person said it, um, that I'll link down below to their response, I think it was on Stack Overflow, that this is how the category tope thinks about mm, continuous maps between X and Y. And as we'll see later, there are many ways we can exploit this. And this is a really cool property. Um, such an object, um, you know, that is the maps from X to Y and has a topology on it. So it's a topological space. Such an object is called an exponential object. And this can in fact be true in any category. It just um, any time you get an element in the category that um, has a set, underlying set is maps from two other elements in the category. Um, that's called an exponential object. So how do we actually construct exponential objects in TOPE? So for XY, spaces in TOPE, Y locally compact, now that's an important assumption. The mapping space um, has underlying set continuous maps from Y to X. Um, so remember Y is locally compact. And the following subbase. So if you wanna just take a look at that for a second, um, this is what is called the compact open topology and you know it's a little bit weird one way to think about it um, one way that um, it kind of explains the motivation is it explains when two functions should be considered close together so right like let's consider like when would this diagram not commute well it would commute if k not it would not commute if k was mapped to somewhere um, you know, outside of you. So this is saying two elements are considered close together if they both map K into you completely. Um, and it uses sets of these elements as a subbase. And proposition 1.19 is kind of what I just spoiled, saying that when Y is locally compact, the mapping space is an exponential object. Now, this is not to understate, you know, the depth of this proposition, right? It's definitely a non-trivial proof, as you could probably just imagine by seeing how the compact open topology is defined. Um, but nonetheless, um, we won't go into it here. Um, the NLAB page has a link to some proofs of it, but this is a really cool fact, right? Um, so one way of characterizing exponential objects is by saying that, you know, I mean, at least in TOPE, continuous map from the product topological space, you know, Z across Y to X 
amounts to continuous maps from Z to the mapping space. And a particular case of this is what we talked about that, you know, when Z is 1, continuous maps from uh, Y to X is just continuous maps from 1 to the mapping space, which again is just elements of the mapping space. As a final remark, I want to emphasize that the assumption that Y is locally compact is necessary. If we remove this assumption, it's not true in general that what we define to be the mapping space is an exponential object. Now, there are cases when we don't want to make such an assumption, you know. So we might try in the future to pass to a more restricted subcategory of Tope in which every mapping space is an exponential object. And such things are called, um, um, they're called Cartesian closed categories. They're categories in which, you know, maps between two objects in those categories, there's always an exponential object. And sometimes we can try to pass into that category. So this is what I alluded to earlier with compactly generated topological spaces. Um, and this makes a lot of things easier um, when it comes to certain constructions, such as something called a smash product being associative and other things. But yeah, that's all I have for now. Um, if you stuck through to the end, thank you so much for watching. And uh, I can't wait to move on towards some real homotopy, which we'll be talking about next time.